Welcome back to the demo series where I introduced a series of management, administration, and leadership. This is episode 48. Today we'll explore signaling theory, a theory that explains how information is communicated between parties when there is asymmetry in available information. Signaling theory describes scenarios where one party, the signaler, sends observable signals that carry credible information about unobservable qualities to another party, the receiver. This theory is particularly relevant in organizational settings where decision makers often have incomplete or imperfect information. Whether you are a leader trying to communicate your organization's value to stakeholders, a job applicant attempting to stand out in a competitive market, or a manager aiming to motivate your team, understanding signaling theory can provide valuable insights in how information is conveyed and interpreted in the workplace. In fact, the behavioral approach to leadership shares important aspects with the signaling theory. The behavioral approach to leadership assumes that effective leadership can be identified just through observable patterns of behavior, such as task-oriented or people-oriented behaviors. Leadership behaviors can serve as signals, but leadership is also more than just behaviors as signals. It's also about understanding the broader organizational context. Leadership also includes organizational science, which is about the structure, how people interact in groups, and dynamics in organizations. Let's come back to signaling theory. The history of signaling theory can be traced back for centuries, even if we didn't have a name for it. In the colonial era, the British officers strutted around in a coat of the brightest red you've ever seen. This was not just a fashion statement. Those coats were dyed with expensive cochineal, which made them far pricier than the uniforms of ordinary soldiers. It was a clear signal of the prestige and the power. Fast forward to the 19th century, the nouveau riche made waves with their extravagant spending. This indulgent behavior signaled their newfound status to society. The conspicuous consumption of valuable goods is a means of reputability. Those historical examples show us that signaling has long been a part of human life, even before we had the tools to study it formally. Despite our long history of signaling behavior, it was not until 1973 that someone pulled it all together in a formal theory. In 1973, Michael Spence published his dissertation on job market signaling. In his dissertation, Spence provided the first rigorous economic framework for understanding those signaling behaviors we've been seeing for centuries. So there you have it, signaling theory, a theory as old as human society, but only formally recognized and studied in the last 50 years. It's a perfect example of how sometimes the most powerful ideas are hiding in plain sight, just waiting for someone to shine a light on them. Let's look at the basics of signaling theory. At its core, signaling theory describes scenarios where one party the signaler sends observable signal that carry credible information about unobservable qualities to another party, the receiver. Think about a peacock's tail. It's bright, it's flashy, and it's a signal. But what is it signaling? Health, genetic quality, and the fitness as a mate. The peahen cannot directly observe those qualities, so she relies on the signal of the tail. Now you may be thinking, that's great for peacocks, but what about my work? Well, signaling is everywhere. Think about a leader who consistently arrives early to meetings or communicates transparently with his team. Those behaviors serve as signals conveying underlying qualities like commitment, reliability, and trustworthiness. Just like the peacock's tail, those signals are meant to shape perceptions. In the workplace, signals can influence decisions about promotions, partnerships, or trust in leadership. 
and the administrator's decision to implement an open door policy may signal approachability, even though the true intention behind the policy may not be directly visible to employees. Now, think about what qualities you want your team members to recognize. What signals are you sending through your behaviors, communications, and the decisions? Now that we've got the basics down, let's break signaling theory into its four key components. The signaler, the signal, the receiver, and signal costs. The signaler is the party with the information advantage. In an organizational context, it could be a company signaling to investors, a job candidate signaling to employers, or a leader signaling to their team. The signal is the observable action or characteristic that conveys information about the unobservable quality. Remember, the power of a signal lies in its cost. A good signal is one that's more costly for low-quality signaler to produce than for high-quality signalers. The receiver is the party with less information who is trying to make a decision. For example, in the hiring process, the employer is the receiver. They don't have direct access to all of the job candidates' traits, such as work ethic, reliability, or problem-solving skills. Instead, they rely on signals like resumes, references, and interview performance to infer those unobservable qualities. The employer, as the receiver, uses those signals to make decisions about whom to hire. During an interview, candidates provide observable behaviors, how they communicate, solve problems, and handle pressure. That function as the signals their underlying traits, like competence, professionalism, and interpersonal skills. Therefore, strong interview performance can signal qualities like confidence, adaptability, and expertise, which influence the employer's hiring decision. Signal cost refers to the resources expended or risk taken when producing a signal. For a signal to be effective, it must have differential costs, meaning it should be more expensive or difficult for low-quality signals to produce than for high-quality signals. This cost differential is important in maintaining the signal's reliability as an indicator of quality. Consider the example of quick decision-making, often seen as a sign of competence. For Abby, a high-quality signaler with rich experience and rapid information processing skills, the cost of making fast decisions is low. She has the ability to back up this signal, which makes it an authentic representation of her competence. By contrast, a low-quality signaler without experience or information processing capabilities would find the cost of quick decision-making much higher. They may attempt to mimic this signal of being decisive, but doing so would incur significantly greater costs in terms of mental effort, stress, and the potential mistakes. This makes it unsustainable or unwise for them to consistently produce this signal of being decisive in decision-making. The difference in costs between high-quality and low-quality signalers is what prevents the latter from easily imitating high-quality signals. As a result, fast decision-making remains a reliable indicator of competence. The differential costs lead to what economists call a separating equilibrium. This is a situation where high-quality and low-quality signalers end up choosing different strategies, effectively separating themselves into distinct groups. In an organizational context, signaling theory helps explain how organizations communicate information about themselves to stakeholders when there is information asymmetry. Organizations frequently use signals to communicate with their stakeholders. This is important because stakeholders often lack complete information about an organization's internal operations and future prospects. 
take leadership succession as an example. The appointment of a new leader, especially following a period of poor performance or misconduct, can signal an organization's intent to change direction. Stakeholders often react positively to outside successors in those situations because it signals a clean break from past problems. Organizations also use signals to attract potential employees. In the competitive job market, organizations need to differentiate themselves and communicate their values as employers. One common signal is the adoption of employee-friendly policies. Offering flexible work arrangements can signal that an organization values work-life balance. This can be particularly attractive to younger employees or those with family responsibilities. Information intermediaries are third-party entities that collect, analyze, interpret, and disseminate information about organizations to other stakeholders. Those intermediaries serve as a bridge between organizations and their stakeholders to reduce information asymmetry in the market. Information intermediaries could be analysts, auditing firms, and media outlets. It's important to note that information intermediaries are not infallible. Their interpretations can be biased or mistaken, and in some cases, they may face conflicts of interest. The financial crisis of 2008, for example, highlighted issues with how credit rating agencies were operating. Organizations also use signals to communicate with their customers, particularly about product or service quality. Warranties are a classic example of signaling to customers. By offering a long or comprehensive warranty, a company signals confidence in its product's quality. This signal is incredible because it will be costly for the company if the product frequently failed. In education, the university renting system serves as a powerful signal to prospective students about the quality of institutions. Universities use their positions in those rankings to communicate their prestige academic quality, and the potential value to students. This signal is credible because achieving and maintaining a high ranking is costly. It requires substantial investments in faculty, research, facilities, and student services. Moreover, ranking typically incorporates metrics like graduate employment rates and research output, which are difficult to manipulate in the short term. Therefore, a consistently high ranking serves as a strong signal of sustained quality and performance. However, this signal comes with a cost. Universities must continually invest in maintaining their ranking position or risk losing their perceived status and attractiveness to top students and faculty. But recently, there has been reporting about inaccurate data provided by some institutions to ranking organizations. It casts doubt on the reliability of those rankings as quality signals. Several high-profile cases have emerged where universities were found to have submitted inflated or false data to improve their standing. Additionally, a number of elite universities, including Harvard Law School, Yale Law School, and Stanford Law School, have withdrawn from participating in the U.S. News and World Report rankings, citing concerns about the methodology and the ranking's impact on educational priorities. Those schools argue that the metrics used in ranking often fail to capture the true quality of education and can incentivize decisions that may not be in students' best interests. This situation highlights the complex nature of signaling in education and raises questions about the effectiveness and ethics of using rankings as a primary signal of education quality. It also demonstrates how signals that were once considered credible can lose their value if their underlying system is perceived as flawed or manipulable. Organizations can also send signals to their competitors and potential alliance partners. For competitors, signals may be used to deter entry into a market. For example, 
An organization may signal commitment to a market by making large irreversible investments in that area. This signal to competitors that the organization is prepared to compete fiercely, potentially deterring new entrants. For potential alliance partners, the signals are often used to demonstrate the organization's attractiveness as a partner. Publishing research findings or obtaining patents can signal an organization's technological capacities, which makes it more attractive to potential research and development partners. At the individual level, signaling theory explains how we communicate unobservable qualities about ourselves through observable behaviors or characteristics. One of the most common applications of signaling theory is in the job market. Job applicants use different signals to communicate their unobservable qualities to potential employers. Educational signals can be obtaining a degree from a prestigious university. Experience signals can be previous work experience, especially in reputable organizations. Skill-based signals can be certifications or specific technical skills listed on the resume. Online presence signals can be a well-crafted LinkedIn profile. It was found that specific LinkedIn profile characteristics serve as signals of unobservable qualities to potential employers. Moreover, overqualification signals, such as expensive job titles or extensive industry experience are interpreted differently for men and women. For male candidates, being overqualified tends to negatively influence hiring outcomes. Overqualified men are perceived as less committed to the prospective organization and are less likely to receive job offers compared to sufficiently qualified men. But for female candidates, being overqualified tends to positively influence hiring outcomes. Overqualified women are perceived as more committed to both their careers and the prospective organization and are more likely to receive job offers compared to sufficiently qualified women. The findings suggest women may need to be overqualified to overcome gendered assumptions and achieve the same hiring outcome as sufficiently qualified men, which perpetuates gender inequality in the labor market. Signaling also plays a key role in leader-follower dynamics in organizations. A leader who consistently seeks input from team members signals a collaborative leadership style. In an article titled, No Guts, No Glory, How Risk-Taking Shapes Dominance, Prestige, and Leadership Endorsement, published in 2021 in Journal of Applied Psychology, Van Cliff and his colleagues examined how risk-taking behavior by leaders influenced the perception of their dominance and prestige, as well as leadership endorsement. It was found that leaders who engage in risk-taking behaviors are perceived as more dominant, which can increase leadership endorsement in competitive intergroup contexts. Risk-taking was also associated with increased perception of prestige. Importantly, the effects of risk-taking on leadership endorsement depended on social context. Risk-takers were more likely to be endorsed as leaders in competitive situations compared to cooperative ones. The findings highlight how leaders can signal certain qualities through their risk-taking behaviors and how the effectiveness of this signaling depends on situational factors. Risk-taking can be a powerful way for leaders to shape a perception and gain support, particularly in competitive organizational environments. Signaling theory also applies to how individuals communicate with their peers in the workplace. Competence signals can be consistently meeting deadlines and producing high-quality work. Cooperation signals can be offering help to colleagues. Career aspiration signals can be taking on additional responsibilities or leadership roles in projects. Authenticity signals can be sharing personal experience or vulnerabilities. At the end of this video on signaling theory, I do want to talk about virtual signaling. 
Virtual signaling refers to the behavior of publicly expressing opinions or sentiments intended to demonstrate one's good character or moral correctness. In the workplace, this can take different forms. An employee regularly posts about their charity work on the organization's social media platforms. Someone frequently shares their unrelated advocacy work during team meetings. A colleague who loudly proclaims support for social causes, but rarely take concrete action. Now you might be thinking, what's wrong with showing you care about important issues? And that's a fair question. Sometimes virtual signaling does come from a place of genuine conviction. But here is where it gets tricky. Virtual signaling often faces criticism for being inauthentic, self-promotion, a form of performative allyship and potentially distracting from actual job responsibilities. So how do we interpret virtual signaling through the lens of signaling theory? Well, the intent is to signal positive qualities like empathy, ethical behavior, and moral virtue. If the signal is perceived as insincere, it can backfire. And here is where it gets even more complex. Some employees might feel pressured to engage in virtual signaling to align with their organization's stance on social issues. This blurs the lines between personal beliefs and the professional identity. It's also worth noting that the term virtual signaling itself is not without controversy. Some argue it's used too liberally to dismiss genuine moral concerns or shame people for caring about social issues. So where do we draw the line? How do we balance expressing our values with avoiding performative behavior? This is the question I leave you at the end of this video.